Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. We're celebrating our seventh season, and we want to thank you, our viewers, for supporting us throughout the years as we collected seven Emmy nominations for stories focusing on the Asian American community. Today, we're at the Noguchi Museum in Queens, New York. We're going to take a look at trailblazers, including Osama Noguchi, whose work reflects his own personal experience and political activism. But first, here's a sneak peek at what's ahead. United We Stand, Japanese Americans protest the separation of families and children with Suru paper cranes. Rainer Ramirez journeys through Queen's Little Indonesia. Kyung Yoon reports on what the 2020 census means to Asian Americans. Field of Dreams, Minnie Rowe tracks down America's Organic Farmer of the Year. This and more on Asian American Life. Isamu Noguchi was one of the great artists of the 20th century. He combined European modernism with Japanese traditionalism. He's known for his sculptures and his award-winning designs. But did you know that he was also an outspoken activist? In February of 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. Thousands of Japanese Americans, known as Niseis, were rounded up and incarcerated in internment camps. They were suspected of being disloyal to the United States. One of these Niseis was artist Isamu Naguchi, who volunteered to enter the Poston prison camp in Arizona. Life Behind Bars inspired Naguchi to record his experiences and to create sculptures that were exhibited in self-interned 1942 Noguchi in Poston War Relocation Center. His story of art's triumph in the face of social injustice, fear, and repression is displayed through twisted objects and metal. By the time Noguchi left prison, he vowed to never forget the dark period of history and to continue creating, quote, something to an awareness of living. His legacy and life's work of living is seen through modern sculptures, gardens, and the galleries that display his artistic balance of earth, nature, and the world. Noguchi inspired many Japanese Americans to speak out against social injustice, and today many are following in his footsteps with a national movement called Suru, which means folded paper cranes. The Suru Solidarity Project includes Japanese Americans and their descendants who were interned in detention camps during World War II. Today, they're making and hanging paper cranes to protest the detention of immigrant families and their children. Filmmaker Conrad Aderer has more. My name is Becca and my Grandparents and their families were uh, incarcerated in Arkansas. My first like real conversation with my grandmother about her incarceration experience was when I had to do a school project in eighth grade. As soon as I asked her what she was doing when she was 14 years old, uh, was her life like, I realized that all of the questions that I had were completely wrong because she was in a concentration camp when she was 14. and actually at that time separated from her father, who had been arrested on the day of Pearl Harbor. Within the Japanese American community, we have uh, multi-generational trauma from the incarceration of World War II. My mother was incarcerated as a child at the Minidoka concentration camp. What we're seeing is that children are being incarcerated once again in these, in these camps. They're being treated like caged animals. The moral outrage of our community is being expressed through this project called Sudu for Solidarity. When my grandmother was teaching me how to fold a crane around her kitchen table, she talked about how you needed to be intentional. Each movement mattered. Then the final folded crane would be beautiful, right? I think about that in this movement as well. Like we are using this symbol of peace and hope and of our culture to reach out to other communities that are facing incarceration now, who have a history of incarceration as well, sometimes on the exact same lands. We reached out to our larger community to make cranes to send to us for our first um, action in Dilly, Texas. 
we went to the South Texas Family Residential Center, also known as the Dilly Detention Site. It's the largest detention site in the United States. It's a concentration camp for families. We asked for 10,000 crates. Within the two weeks that we had, we received about 30,000 crates. We are here to stand in solidarity with you. We are here to stand in solidarity. I really, I thought back to that moment when I had first imagined my grandmother alone with her family in these camps and that there was no one on the outside. It was such a moving moment to be out there, to be chanting, to be singing, to, you know, get a message across to the people that were in there that someone cares and knows that this is wrong. We met with some families who had just recently been released from Dili. It was heartbreaking to see the immediate effects of what being imprisoned in that place and being separated from your family actually does to you. Queremos estar los aliados que no tenían mi familia. It was powerful to be able to share our stories in a way that, that might give hope to people who are facing horrendous circumstances right now and that we can offer that kind of hope for the future that the, the cranes are meant to represent. We turn to a dramatic scene that unfolded Saturday. Survivors of the U.S. internment camps engaged in civil disobedience outside the Fort Sill Army Post in Oklahoma, where the Trump administration plans to indefinitely detain 1,400 immigrant and refugee children starting next month. We were very clear we do not want any children to be brought to Fort Sill to be incarcerated there. You know, we have been incarcerated there. Native people have been incarcerated there. It is enough. You're not allowed to protest on Fort Sill. You can go across the street, and, you, and that needs to happen right now. We are here to make a statement. Some people here are prepared to make that statement and be arrested. They're wanting to remove us. Uh, we've been removed too many times. We're not leaving. The survivors demand to speak at the gate in defense of children. They risk arrest. It goes viral. Uh, millions of people see this on Twitter. It gains national attention. A month later, uh, the local groups then uh, invite us back. Black Lives, AIM American Indian Territory, and, and Dream Action Oklahoma under the umbrella of United We Dream, which is a national network for young people organizing for immigrant rights. We came with a, a group of uh, Buddhist monks and priests to really back them, right? So, um, and it was awesome. <laughs> they, they turned out from a huge number of states, a sea of young, undocumented people being completely unafraid. Every one of us represents thousands and thousands of people back home, and we will come back. We will come back. As a result of that second action, really, the governor announced that they weren't going to be bringing children to Fort Sill. We see part of our work as trying to heal ourselves and other communities in this process. The work around healing the effects of systematic racism and white supremacy is fundamental to the work of creating something new. Every time that we do this, it is like a, an incredibly emotional experience, both tragic, looking at the full weight of what racism has meant for all of our different communities, and the hopefulness of us coming and facing it together. Indonesia is the world's largest archipelago with more than 17,000 islands and more than 250 million people. It's got the world's largest Muslim population and more than 350 different ethnic groups. And Indonesian immigrants in the U.S. are just as diverse. There's something cooking at the St. James Parish in Elmhurst, Queens. And Fefe Angono is to blame. Every island has different kind of culture, 
language, and uh, you know, of course, it's uh, and food. When Fefe moved to New York from Indonesia more than 20 years ago, she knew there was one thing that could bring the diverse Indonesian American community together. They come here and, you know, because they miss Indonesian food, that's why they come here to try, to try out and they feel happy about it. Seven years ago, she started the Indonesian Food Bazaar and it's become an anticipated monthly event since. The most important is like uh, having fun once a month. We come like a family, we have a, re a reunion while we're making a money. Here, regional food from the world's biggest archipelago is represented. Muslim, Christians and Buddhists come together under one roof. You know, we often come here, you know, for the food and it's also for, you know, to meet our friend, to have like a fellowship with our friends, you know. Sometimes you see your friend that you've never seen for a long time and they, you know, you meet them here. And it's amazing, it's, it's a great experience. The Indonesian American community has really grown more rapidly in the last decade or so. Kavita Rajagopalan is a senior fellow at the World Policy Institute and author of Muslims of the Metropolis. What you'll see is often people of one ethnic background on one, in one block or in one building or even in a single home, right next to people from another community, right next door, but there won't be as much sharing of life. Perhaps the greatest opportunities for uh, interaction will be cuisine-oriented. After Los Angeles and Riverside in California, New York has the third largest Indonesian community in the United States. So a place like a food bazaar will offer an opportunity for people from very different ethnic and religious backgrounds to set up stalls side by side and not only present themselves physically and visibly, in a shared space, but also be understood as part of the same community. Yeah, it's really worth the trip. And, you know, meeting the friends, all the friends there. Andy Sutanto left Indonesia after anti-ethnic Chinese riots gripped his country in the late 90s. In Jakarta back then, most of the stores, especially on the major street, they're destroyed. Uh, it's happened to be I'm one of those people who, who lost through, due to the riot. Andy lives in Connecticut, but he found his community at the Indonesian Food Bazaar in Queens. Once a month, he and his family drive south to showcase traditional food from his home island of Bangka. As you know, love comes from the, from the stomachs. What you eat, that's where the love uh, came and gather people together. And it's very true. In Astoria, Queens, one of the oldest Indonesian masjids in the country also has a monthly food bazaar. I'm not sure if you know about Indonesian community. They have a different states, different cultures, different you know, backgrounds, different languages. However, here we're trying to get to blend in everything together as one community. Right now, we have like food bazaars going on here. They pretty much like everybody from different, you know, like ethnicity, different religions also come together just to try it. Dewi Mulya founded the Indonesian Gastronomy Association, or IGA. So IGA itself is to promote Indonesian food uh, not only food, but uh, also the culture. I travel around the world, actually, in Europe and also uh, back in uh, and Latin, Latin America. But here in New York, it totally surprised me that I can find almost anything that we have in Indonesia. So the sense of bringing together a community in a small space to, to celebrate cultural pride, it actually, it's not just multiculturalism or shallow surface area stuff. There is an opportunity there through these types of events to create and forge new community bonds and to create a whole new community and diaspora. For Asian American Life, this is Rainer Ramirez. I'm Kyung Yoon at Baruch College CUNY, which is a New York research data center for the Census Bureau. 
Every 10 years, our nation gets one chance to count every resident in the United States. But for certain groups, there are risks for being undercounted in the upcoming 2020 census, and the stakes are particularly high for the Asian American community. New York City is home to more than one million Asian Americans, and that was the number counted nearly 10 years ago in the 2010 census. Now, as the city and the country gear up for Census 2020, community leaders say there are many reasons why Asians are often the most vulnerable to being undercounted. They are the fastest growing community here. They often are in new neighborhoods where they're living, they may be living in non-standard housing. They have tremendous linguistic and cultural barriers. They have very little interest in being civically engaged. So in a lot of ways, they are really the target demographic when you're looking at a potential undercount. Steve Choi is the executive director of the New York Immigration Coalition, advocating for immigrant rights, education, and civic participation. He says despite these challenges for the Asian American community, there are also enormous opportunities in the 2020 census if the community can apply the lessons learned from the intensive census effort 10 years ago in Flushing, Queens, home to the largest Asian American community in New York. We counted so many people that by the time redistricting political districts were drawn based on the census count, we were able to create several Asian American majority political districts, including the first ever Asian majority, uh, Asian plurality congressional district. And the Queens County Democratic Party saw the writing on the wall, and Grace Meng ended up running, and she was elected to be the first ever Asian American congresswoman from the state of New York. Beyond determining representation in government, census data dictates the allocation of more than $800 billion per year in federal funding for schools, roads, hospitals, and transportation services. And businesses use it to choose where to invest. The main challenge for the Asian American community is that we have grown so fast and it's all immigrant driven that a lot of people have never experienced a census. Howard Chi directs policy and research at the Asian American Federation, which is leading efforts to equip and educate its members to maximize participation. This is critical when nearly 30 percent of Asian immigrants have lived in the U.S. less than 10 years. Plus, in New York City, more than 60 percent of Asian Americans have limited English proficiency. A controversial push by the Trump administration to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census was blocked by courts over the summer. Still, it reinforced mistrust in immigrant communities about how the federal government will use the data. Census watchers say the only way to get accurate household data will be through working with people and organizations that have the trust of their community members. Our number one message and our principle throughout has been to educate funders, local and state government, that you must put the smallest groups, the most deeply embedded grassroots groups, at the front of the census outreach effort. If we don't do that, we're going to miss people. Period. The key is to take advantage of the trusted voices that are in the community and I think the, the coordination is there. I think there are, everybody's talking to one another. This time around, we have created the New York Counts 2020 Coalition, which brings together so many amazing stakeholders, people representing the nonprofit community, businesses, um, local and state governments, so many different folks who are coming together representing so many different communities. And so there's a real interest and an eagerness to engage deeply. Another complicating factor for the Asian American census count is that for the first time, the census will be conducted primarily online. The city comptroller's office um, recently released a report looking at uh, digital access in, in New York City. And they found that 22% of Asian households do not have broadband internet access, and that's a significant chunk of our population. How do we create opportunities for people to participate when the Census Bureau is pushing uh, heavily on digital response? So we have to work with our local libraries, we have to work with community groups who have uh, space, and a lot of them have computer clusters because they do workforce training and things like that, to make sure that they have secure internet connections. Um, we also have to be ready to, to let them know that what to expect in March when a letter goes out to every household 
uh, with the information on how to respond. For the most rapidly growing ethnic group in the country, the stakes could not be higher. The 2020 census has the potential to get more resources and political power for Asian American communities, but only if their numbers are fully counted. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Ro. In every Chinatown across the country, you can find a bounty of Asian vegetables at stalls like these, from gailan to bok choy to everything in between. Now, back in the 40s and 50s, there were only a handful of farms that grew these vegetables. But as the demand increased, bigger farms began squeezing them out of the market. This is a story of how one such family farm had to reinvent itself, going from near ruin to the top of its field. The character is Sung Li Choi Yun. It means grow more in prosperity and business. And that's how they chose that name. Sang Lee Farms has certainly lived up to its name. Tucked away on the northeastern prong of Long Island's North Fork, the farm has been feeding the community for three generations. It's a very rewarding line of work. There's nothing better than to be able to produce your own food organically and to feed the community. Fred Lee is the second generation of Sang Lee Farms. His son, Will, works alongside him, the third and most recent generation to take the helm. My grandfather, when he came to this country, the United States, um, at the turn of the century, he had a laundromat in Queens Village. My dad and my uncles grew up working in the laundromat. But after returning from World War II, Fred's father and uncle decided to venture into the farming business after realizing there was a market hungry for Asian vegetables. There weren't a whole lot of Chinese vegetable farms, and so there was a growing Asian population in Chinatown. It just seemed like a business opportunity to get involved with the production and to sell into New York City, the Chinatown area. As the Asian population exploded along the East Coast, from Miami to Montreal, so did Sangley Farms. I have fond memories growing up on the farm, being involved in every aspect from working in the field side by side with the harvesting crew to driving the delivery trucks into Chinatown. Despite the fond memories, Fred says he had other plans for his life's work. But while studying business at Boston University, he received news about his father that would ultimately seal his fate. My father became sick uh, with cancer and he passed away uh, six months later. If my father had not become ill with cancer or passed away, I probably would not be farming. As the only son, Fred stepped into his father's boots. But farming in the 80s and 90s was a far cry from his father's day. Competition was fierce and cutthroat, making it difficult for smaller farms like Sang Lee to survive. Some years were so lean that Fred said he feared the farm would go under. And then the eureka moment. We came up with the idea to sell bunches of flowers on the road right in front of the farm. And so our field harvesting crew for the flowers were our three kids and their friends. And from the flowers, that branched into some of the wholesale vegetables that we were selling. Someone would say, what's this? What do I do with this? Do I stir fry this? And can you tell me how? So then the recipes developed. Then the stir fry sauce came from that. Around that same time frame, Fred began transitioning into organic produce. The reason was not for business gain, but rather it was driven by emotion. Like many conventional farmers, Fred relied heavily on chemical pesticides for his crops. Shortly after, the kids would come looking for me and they'd be running across the field that I just sprayed. It dawned on me that I'm spraying these vegetables with chemical pesticides. I'm feeding it to the kids, but I thought there was a better way. Sang Lee Farms became certified organic in 2007. Fast forward to 2019, Fred was selected as the Organic Farmer of the Year by the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New York. There's a heck of a lot of farmers in New York State. We were uh, very grateful and blessed to be named Farmers of the Year for 2019. Plus, the ever-popular farm-to-table movement is creating a demand for locally sourced organic produce and has renewed interest in farming, especially in the younger population. Sangley Farms is well-positioned, once again, 
to tap into a niche market. I have been surprised by the number of young people that have applied for work and that are working with us now. So even though they could find a job in New York City, uh, working in a bank and whatever, it pales in comparison to be able to transplant a melon plant and see it grow out over a number of weeks or months. The farm has come a long way from its humble beginnings as a wholesale distributor to Asian markets. It now grows over 100 types of organic produce that are sold directly to the consumer at farmers markets, community supported agriculture or CSA programs, and its on site farm stand. It's a decision that Fred does not regret. When I sold to brokers, I don't think once in 20 or 30 years any one of the distributors ever really thanked me for sending a great load of vegetables. To go to a farmer's market now and to have someone look me straight in the face and they say, thank you for doing what you do. It's rewarding and it probably keeps me engaged. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. If you want more information on our show, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel Danilo. We'll see you next time.